Um, anyhow, I'm here to talk about peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Uh, it's a long one, PRRT. Um, before I jump into that, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of CPC Scientific. Uh, so CPC is a peptide CDMO. Uh, we specialize in custom peptide production, um, full-time equivalent services we provide. Um, also, we have an extensive uh, catalog of peptides that are readily off the shelf. And we do GMP manufacturing and support all clinical phases as well as commercial. We also have a portfolio of uh, generic API peptides and have EMFs in the uh, Chinese market, US market, as well as European market. And then we also have introduced oligonucleotide services in the last couple of years as well. This is a snapshot of the history of CPC Scientific. So we were founded in 2001 by Sean Lee. Uh, some of you might know Sean Lee, who founded uh, American Peptide uh, previously. And then we've had a number of milestones and uh, expansions of our facility, 2004, 2010. And our very last expansion was 2016 with our current facility in Hangzhou. And then we've actually purchased a new facility in 2022 in the US, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute here. We've had a number of other milestones as well. Um, um, we've had regulatory um, approvals as well as uh, um, a, a few other um, inspections. Now here's our three uh, primary sites. We have our primary manufacturing site again in Hangzhou, China. Uh, our business offices are in San Jose, California. And then our new manufacturing uh, um, facility is in Rockland, California, which is pretty nearby to here, uh, just outside of Sacramento on the way up to Lake Hot Tahoe, actually. So maybe we'll get some visitors. This is our Hangzhou um, campus. We have over, over 450,000 square feet of manufacturing um, space with over 400 scientists. For PMP production, we have 24 isolated uh, process suites, 19 of those are synthesis suites, uh, 5 of those are um, cleavage suites, and then 19 purification suites. So this allows for quite a bit of parallel production of GMP, large-scale GMP projects, and with that we can do um, 500 kilos per year approximately at that site. Now our new facility in, um, in Rockland, California, we're actually working on the build out right now. We expect to be this, this to be um, able to produce GMP material by later next year. Um, and this will be a large scale GMP manufacturing of peptide APIs. Okay. And then this is just a little bit of our capacity at the current site in, in Hangzhou. We have lyophilizers up to a thousand liter um, Columns, our largest column is the 30-inch, 30, 30 and then a 1,000-liter uh, solid-phase synthesis reactors are largest scale. So some large-scale capabilities, and we expect to bring the same to our other site as well. And then we also thought I'd mention that we, we are a worldwide company as far as the, the projects that we support, and we have approvals in multiple countries, including the U.S., Japan, Europe, uh, Korea, China, etc., and then we also have a robust pipeline of projects through, through all clinical phases as well as commercial. I'll move on to the meat of the uh, topic here. Again, peptide receptor nucleotide therapy. Uh, this starts with really a targeting peptide. I don't know if this works. Um, so we have a targeting peptide which targets uh, receptors that are overexpressed in cancer cells. Uh, with that, we deliver a cytotoxic uh, radionuclide chelate or we have a radionuclide chelate where we deliver cytotoxic levels of, um, to cancer cells. PRRTs have been around for a long, long time. I think this was mentioned yesterday a little bit, but they really haven't come around in the U.S. market um, or had much, much of a push until fairly recently. Uh, there was a very successful uh, Netter-1 trial, uh, phase three trial in 2017 which led to a number of approvals in 2018 through 2022. There are quite a few approvals. And so there's been quite a huge uptake of interest from, for a number of companies that are developing these therapeutics. Uh, this is a snapshot of some of the FDA-approved uh, uh, radionuclide peptide conjugates as well. 
So I probably don't need to tell it to this audience here why peptides, uh, why we favor peptides. Again, compared to many of the other molecules, uh, large molecules uh, or um, antibodies, uh, they're pretty small. They're able to penetrate pretty readily into the, the target uh, tissues. Uh, positive pharmacokinetic, uh, pharmacokinetics, um, they're able to localize into the target region and get very fast to renal clearance. And they have high, um, have high affinity for the, um, and specificity towards the um, receptor targets. They also have lower immunogenicity compared to some larger molecules. They're generally considered non-toxic and have minimal side effects due to off-target binding. Uh, and a thing that really sticks out as well as, um, is also the cost and the development timelines. So that's, that's very attractive for these. Now these are just uh, kind of the steps for what you need to do prior to getting in the clinic. Again, target identification, making sure you do identify a receptor target that's overexpressed. Identifying a, a synthetic peptide which has strong, strong uh, binding affinity for the target receptor. And then the chelate design. This is the part where we're really highly involved with. Um, making sure we have a synthetic peptide when we attach the linker as well as the chelate by functional chelate that we don't interfere with the binding to the target receptor. And then the other activities that need to follow are selection of a radionuclide that's a, a therapeutic, um, the radiolabeling procedure, which is not uh, trivial, and then move on to in vitro characterization, in vivo assessment, and then dosimetry data to determine the final doses that you're going to use for your human trials. Uh, these are some of the bifunctional chelates that uh, CPC has worked with. We've worked with a number of these, and actually I'll talk about uh, Dotaga, um, which we've in this uh, project that we're talking about here. Uh, the selection of the uh, metal isotopes as well, there's many considerations to consider. First of all, it's a therapeutic or uh, imaging or theragnostic. And then uh, really the types of particles and waves, alpha, beta, auger, gamma, and the range of penetration as well is something to consider. So these, just an example of the alpha, um, beta, and gamma, as well as auger, and then um, really whatever is the best approach for that therapeutic. And this is just a snapshot of some approved peptides that are overexpressed in, in tumors. These are fairly well-known peptides uh, that most of us know. So CPC has been involved with the development of a number of these projects for quite a few years. Uh, these are some uh, um, cited papers that we've included here for a few um, PRRTs that we've, we've worked to develop for some customers. And here sh we show in the red um, some target, the targets, and then on the left in the black, essentially the, um, the peptide that's targeting those receptors. So this is the case study. Uh, this is for the GMP manufacturing process of a Dotaga-labeled urea-based uh, peptide PSMA inhibitor. Uh, PSMA, or prostate-specific prostate uh, membrane antigen. Uh, PSMA is a, is a type 2 membrane uh, metalloenzyme. It's approximately 750 amino acids in length. Uh, it's uh, expressed in prostate, but it's also expressed in a number of other tissues. The advantages of PSMA uh, over many others is it's highly expressed, um, up to a thousandfold higher in, uh, in cancer tissue than normal tissue. Uh, it's also expressed highly at all stages of prostate cancer, so it's a very good target. And then the transmain conformation allows for, for good internal, internalization of the therapeutic. Uh, so there's three main types of inhibitors we can look at. Uh, these are phosphorus-based, thiol-based, or urea-based. Uh, there's some downfalls in, uh, to a couple of these. The phosphorus-based, uh, really the polarity is a little bit of a challenge and potentially limits their ability to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Thiol-based, uh, they do have uh, metabolic challenges due to oxidation. And what we're seeing is really the urea-based the urea, urea ligands are the most favored and the ones that are mostly going into the clinic from what we've seen. 
Uh, they have a high uh, binding affinity as well as a pretty favorable stability. Uh, negatively charged linkers can also reduce off-target retention. And uh, there are hydrophobic uh, aromatic structures included into the linker to help with the, um, improve the binding of the PSMA. PSMA. So some of the things that we consider in the, um, in the design uh, definitely is the total charge, um, the chemical elements in there. Um, hydrophobicity is a very important factor. Uh, the, the linker, we incorporate a number of amino acids. Uh, we try to incorporate many D amino acids just to help with the uh, metabolic stability. And then also some aromatic structures to make sure that we um, are able to interact with this S1 accessory site. So this is a graphic of the uh, PSMA active binding site. And as you can see, there's a, a 20 angstrom entrance funnel, so we need to have a fairly long dipping down into that pocket. Uh, the action um, area, the glutamate pocket, we have the um, urea moiety interacting there. And then we also have an arginine patch, and then importantly, the S1 accessory site where we need to um, fit in and have a good hydrophobic interaction for, um, for higher uh, binding affinity. So uh, we look at this molecule here. We have, um, we have uh, the PMSA binding area, the lysine urea glutamate. Uh, then we have a long chain uh, structure with the, the D amino acids. And then the, um, the aromatic structures, which are going to uh, interact with that, with that pocket. So we produced this peptide using a standard FMOC solid phase uh, peptide synthesis strategy. Uh, first of all, we attach to, uh, to chlorotrital chloride resin, and then we add the peptide in a few fragments. First of all, um, um, the glutamyl urea lysine um, is added in a fragment, and then we add one more fragment, and then we add two um, in series uh, D amino acids. And then we have, a, after that structure, we'll then just add the, um, uh, the dotaga. And then we have the fully protected uh, structure there. So following that, we do um, actually um, a single step deprotection and cleavage, which is pretty normal for most peptide production. But uh, I think, what, as was mentioned yesterday, uh, it is fairly challenging. Dotaga, is, uh, um, these chelating agents do have some other potential problems. So there was quite a bit of development needed to get a clean deprotection, um, as well as making sure we have uh, method development for the synthetic process, which I just pointed out, uh, to make sure we don't have um, uh, too many isomeric impurities as well. And then we were also able to develop a purification strategy to help remove some isomeric impurities, which are a challenge in this type of molecule. In the end, we were able to get very high, um, a high yield and a high purity of this product, uh, which enabled the success for the GMP project. So the, the crude, as you can see, is very clean crude product um, after, after the process development. And then the final purified product, uh, you can't see here, but 99.3, very clean, but also isomeric uh, purity is extremely high. So this is a... Uh, See if it still works. Okay. The timeline for for the full development of this. So it's a very aggressive timeline. You can see we have ten months from going from uh, process development all the way through to um, IND submission. Uh, we spent about three months doing the process development and analytical development in the series. And really, the success of that three months is what led to the success of this program and able to meet that, that tight timeline. Um, and the, the real highlights from here are just developing a really robust process and getting a very high efficient uh, process, um, high yield, and high purity to allow this to be successful. We also have a number of other Dotaga programs that we've done in. Um, that we've been working on. So we have uh, citations that uh, are public knowledge and then many other PRRT programs. So um, definitely, if you want, are interested in any of these, we're glad to share those with you. 
And then last but not least, I would like to uh, share with you, we've had a number of our uh, business development folks here. Um, our our v senior VP of business development, Howard Huang, is here. Andy Yan, who's the director of business development in the Eastern region. And Michael Zhang, who's the development manager for the Western region. So thank you very much, and please feel free with any questions.